Welcome everybody. Uh, it's such an honor to be here with the biology department, the women's leadership uh, network, to uh, be here to celebrate Women's History Month and 50 years co-education here at St. Francis College with a student-moderated panel celebrating the work of three extraordinary women in the sciences. This panel today will be used as a springboard to explore not science as a research method, but science as an opportunity for self-reflection and examination, the roles of ethics and responsibilities in scientific practice, communicating science, and the negative effects of miscommunicating science. What is the role of dissent in multiple narratives and when we're considering new scientific policies? And how can science change to promote racial, ethnic, economic, and neurodiversity in both this generation of scientists and the next generation of scientists? All of our outstanding panelists today uh, will be use, it, use their backgrounds in science to question and change the way that science is practiced in society. Dr. Raquel Castellanos and Dr. Cristina uh, Medina Ramirez are both extraordinary alums of the conference of the college who graduated in 2003. And um, Dr. Inma Melo Martin uh, is, has worked to uh, transform science and society by questioning the applications of both technological and scientific advances, advances to policy. So I will just give a brief introduction of the biographies of our speakers before I hand it over to our student moderator, Janelli Abar. Okay. So should I start with Janelli or should I start with the panelists? <laughs> the panelists, right? Okay. Uh, Christina Medina Medina. Ramirez is the first director of the Skirball Science Learning Center at Hunter College, CUNY, which opened in the spring of 2017. In this role, she has implemented comprehensive <coughs> academic support programs to improve science course performance in STEM. She also has worked as the professional development coordinator of the NIH-sponsored RISE Research Initiative for Scientific Enhancement Program at Hunter, um, which she has developed programming focusing on career development and building scientific core competencies. Dr. Medina Ramirez received her BS in biology from right here, St. Francis College, and her PhD in biomedical science from Albert Einstein. Um, I'll end it there, but she has many honors and awards. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Inma de Melo Martin uh, is a professor of medical ethics, the Division of Medical Ethics at Weill Cornell Medical College here in New York City. She holds her PhD in philosophy and her MS in molecular biology. Her research interests include bioethics and the philosophy of science. Our final uh, panelist, Raquel Casellanos, is also an SFC alum who is currently working as the Assistant Director of the Office of Research and Diversity Training at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. She develops initiatives geared towards increasing the number of underrepresented minority trainees in biomedical sciences, and is passionate about mentoring and sharing her own personal stories as a Latina in STEM to motivate students to pursue scientific careers. Raquel earned her PhD in biomedical sciences and completed her research training at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Moderating this panel, moderating this panel, I would like to introduce Janelli Abar, a senior here at St. Francis College who will be graduating this May with a BS, uh, majoring in biology and minoring in chemistry. She's the president of the Make a Difference Club, coordinated the big event, and is part of the Women's Leadership Network, which is the key sponsor of today's panel. Um, outside of school, Janelli has taught workshops for the blind and deaf, who completed over 300 hours of clinical shadowing, and was a research assistant for NYP and Wild Cornell, as well as being a scholar for the Rutgers Summer Health Professions Education Program. 
uh, Janelli is a leader and mentor for other students, and I look forward to hearing her um, moderate today's panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dell. Um, I would also like to say thank you to Women's Leadership Network and one of our final convening members here, Liz, um, and also Catherine O'Hagan from the Office of Advancement. We really appreciate you for making this possible today. So um, I would just like to start off with um, another round of applause to our panelists for making it here. Um, in a few sentences, tell us more on how did you achieve your current career and life path? What were your motivations? So anyone? <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Christina Zanino Ramirez, and um, really my motivation to enter the sciences um, as a career all started here at St. Francis. So um, I actually started as a medical technology major, and my reason for starting in this major was because I graduated high school, I really loved science, but didn't really understand how to apply that in a practical way into a career. So um, I knew I didn't want to go into medicine, and I didn't want to become a teacher. And so I thought that with a biology degree, that that was the only path. So the only major that I saw that kind of involved science that maybe led to a career that I can work in a lab, because that sounds enticing to me, was that. But um, my vision of my future kind of totally changed um, within two years of starting uh, St. Francis. So, um, one of the, the things that happened as I was here is I met great professors who really um, kind of saw potential in me to better advise me as to what, I, what my goals were and what I, how I can apply those goals to this career. So, um, I was lucky enough to meet some professors here, like Dr. Goldberg, Dr. Fredowski, Dr. Nolan, who um, really were great mentors to, well, and that was also the first time I ever met anybody who had a PhD. Maybe some of you are students here have not met anybody with a PhD until so they started college. Is that true for some of you? Many of you? So how do you think you're supposed to know what that path is if you haven't even met anybody who does it, right? You go to the doctor, you meet doctors, you see, people with different career paths. So um, I was enlightened as to what a PhD was and what biomedical research was through uh, doing summer research programs. So I had done a summer research program um, first at Hunter College, where I'm at now. You see things go full circle, right? Um, so I did a summer research program there, and I fell in love with science. So um, after that, I had um, really made my goal to pursue science as a career PhD, and um, then went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine where I studied biomedical uh, research, specifically molecular biology, and uh, how that relates to cancer. So, um, although the experience was wonderful, I love that process of getting a PhD and learning how to become a scientist, and creating new knowledge. Um, my heart, in terms of where I wanted to go for my career, my future, was really to engage with students, and particularly undergraduate students, because the impact when I was in college, um, the experience in college was so impactful that I really wanted to help students who were once in my shoes. So um, after, um, so I decided to be bench research and to pursue opportunities that allow me to engage with students like you all. So um, in 2012, I began working at Hunter College with the RISE program, which helps students who are from underrepresented backgrounds um, pursue PhD degrees. So basically, I was kind of like um, the person who all the students came to to help prepare for all their professional skills outside of the lab. So how to write their applications for a graduate school, 
how to prepare scientific presentations, and all these skills that you need to be a good scientist and to prep for graduate programs. And I also worked with graduate students who are pursuing PhDs and how to um, um, basically build professional skills that you can use outside the lab. Um, and since 2017, two, two years ago, I um, moved into a new position at the College. Um, I'm the director now of the Storval Science Learning Center. And so now I get to basically work with all the populations of science students throughout the college um, by providing academic support, such as peer tutoring services, uh, different workshops and boot camps that align with the science courses to help students <coughs> succeed. Um, and that's pretty much how my path. Um, from undergrad to, to now in a nutshell. Um, I guess I'll go with Raquel. <laughs> so Christina and I have very similar similar, similar paths. Um, we were both students here at the same time at St. Francis College and we became best friends and we're still great friends now and her baby's godmother. <laughs> um, I came to St. Francis thinking that I was going to be Meant that I was going to go to medical school. Uh, I'm first generation Chicana. My parents are originally from Mexico. Um, and they came to this country about 40 years ago um, looking for a better life for themselves, for the kids that they would have. And sort of part of the, the, those ideas that you have about the American dream are to become a doctor or to become a lawyer or to become big titles like that. And so I was always naturally good at science, and I, I went to college thinking that I was going to go eventually to medical school. Um, I didn't know that you could become a scientist. I also had never met a PhD before, so I had no idea that you could go into that field um, until I encountered really good mentors here as well, just like, just like Christina mentioned. Um, and I also did a summer research program. And that opened up my eyes to a field that I did not know. I didn't know that you could do scientific discoveries. Um, I didn't know that you could do this as a career. And that really changed my perspective as to what I wanted to pursue later on in my career. So I finished my bachelor's here in 2003. We, we graduated together. Um, I have done two summer research programs, one at, at Columbia and one at Hunter College. Uh, and after I graduated, I did two years of a post-baccalaureate research program to sort of enhance my application with more research experience. So I went back to the lab where I had done research as a summer student um, at Columbia, and I was there for two years, preparing myself for what graduate school would be. Um, and I sort of followed Christina's path again, and I went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. Um, there, I did research in genetics and developmental biology. And it was a really amazing experience to be able to do science like that, uh, to be able to discover something new, to give something back to the scientific field. Um, the intellectual liberty that you, that you have when you're a graduate student is really incomparable. You don't ever experience that, I think, ever again in your career in that same way, um, and I became a scientist. I defended my thesis in 2014, and then I transitioned into a postdoc uh, fellowship uh, at Einstein, but I switched gears a little bit, so I, I took what I learned in graduate school doing developmental biology, and I applied that to cancer biology, studying neuroblastoma. But throughout all this time, I was really also very uh, focused and devoted to the mission of diversifying biomedical sciences. So I was involved with a lot of different initiatives on campus uh, and programming that was uh, focused on that. And so I had sort of that calling um, to work with students. I really wanted to be able to develop programs and be in a position where I could advocate for those things. Um, and so I transitioned into higher ed administration so I first worked at John Jay College, which is also part of the CUNY system, um, uh, coordinating their undergraduate research program. And I was there for about two years, 
And that was a really amazing experience working with students, developing programs. That was really my first time doing that on my own and taking a leadership role in that. Um, and about two years ago, I transitioned into the position that I'm in now, which is assistant director um, for the Office of Research and Diversity Training at the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm specifically at the medical school, and I work with undergraduate students, I work with postdoc students, I work with graduate students um, in different, in different pro programs. Um, and I feel like I can use all of the skills that I learned as a scientist in different ways in, in my role now. I can talk to my students about science. I can talk to them about what it's like being a first generation student, what it's like being a woman in science. Um, and I think that you know, uh, sharing my own personal experiences in my path really helps me connect with my students. So I'm excited to be here today and share with you a little bit about what I know. Um, and I look forward to chatting with you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm actually not a scientist, so I'm a philosopher. Um, I am originally from Spain. In Spain, actually, you study philosophy in high school. So the first time I took a philosophy course, I fell in love with philosophy. And I thought, <laughs> this is what I want to do. Um, but I also loved biology. Um, so it was a tough decision. Um, you know, to decide whether to go to the university and do philosophy or do uh, biology. Um, ultimately, I thought if I do philosophy, I might be able to still work in the sciences, in the biomedical sciences in particular. If I do biology, it's unlikely that I am going to be able to do philosophy. Turns out that I was right. Uh, so I went to the university, did my undergraduate in Spain, came to the United States to do my PhD. Uh, in philosophy. Uh, I work on issues related to uh, philosophy of science and philosophy of technology. Um, and uh, after I was working at, uh, at the university teaching uh, philosophy uh, in undergraduate, uh, to undergraduates, I, I, one, I had had the experience that when I went to, to uh, conferences to talk about problems in the sciences on, or with technology, Scientists usually didn't give me, uh, didn't pay much attention to what I had to say. And part of the reason was that I didn't have a science degree. It didn't matter that I knew what I was talking about. The fact that I didn't have a degree didn't give me credibility. So while I was working, I decided to go back to school and get a master's in molecular biology so that I could actually uh, keep doing the same work that I had been doing uh, until then. Uh, but now, uh, the fact that I had a degree gave me uh, credibility in the size of um, uh, scientists, actually. Um, then I got recruited uh, by Cornell here uh, to, to actually work with researchers um, who do uh, human subject research. Uh, so a significant amount of my work is to um, help scientists think about some of the ethical implications of doing work um, in clinical trials, uh, high risk normally clinical trials, uh, in many cases related either to genetics or uh, stem cell research. Um, so that's what I have been doing for you know quite a few years now. Um, I'm also I uh, uh, my division also is in charge of the medical education for uh, medical ethics for uh, the medical school. So we teach um, all of the medical ethics courses for um, for the medical. Uh, students and um, a significant amount of my work of my research uh, is actually on thinking about what are some of the ethical and epistemic implications of the research that we do uh, in biology in the biomedical sciences in general um, both in biology and technology so thank you thank you so much so interesting you all studied around the same thing but just took very different paths right um, so I just want to point out that your path doesn't always have to be so linear. You know, I know sometimes we all panic because we want to go the traditional way, but as you see, you, you can get there and go a lot of different paths. So how do you see the role of science in society? Uh, well, um, so, well, it's obviously very important. Um, we need uh, science 
for practically anything that is important in our lives, particularly again uh, biomedical sciences. So you know, thinking about whether what the doctor is telling me makes sense requires that I have some knowledge of the science. Thinking about what kind of public policies we need requires some knowledge of the sciences. Thinking about whether the first page of the New York Times, you know, talking about some new drug or some new discovery uh, requires that we have some knowledge of the sciences, that we are able to be critical of the work uh, that scientists do. Um, so it's difficult to live in our society today without having some knowledge of how scientists uh, work and what kinds of things uh, they are doing. I think that there are many reasons to be critical of what uh, our research enterprise is today, and perhaps we can talk more about that. Uh, so a significant amount of my work is actually bring up some of those uh, problems, some of those concerns that arise in the context of, um, of the biomedical sciences. I think it's critical for a society to know more about science. Um, for all of the reasons that, that you just mentioned. I mean, um, where are our tax dollars going, right? When, when the NIH, which is the National Institutes of Health, decides to uh, fund these researchers, people need to understand why that money is being distributed the way that it's being distributed um, in deciding public policy, how different health risks are handled, um, we, even just reading the newspaper, right? Like, we need to have some sort of prior basic knowledge in science to be able to interpret and understand what's going on. And it seems like that's really lacking, right? Um, and I think that there's a couple of issues, a couple of reasons why that is. Uh, part of it is part of the education system. Part of it is the way that the information is disseminated. Part of it is the scientists being so perhaps out of touch, out of society, and not making that information as easily accessible to communities. So I think we're probably going to talk about some of those things during this session. Um, but that's something that, that we talk, I mean, at least I talk a lot about with my students, um, being able to talk about their science. And when they're explaining what they're working on, I always tell them, think about how your grandmother would understand this, what your grandma understands. Um, because your grandma needs to understand what's going on in the scientific field, right? In order for us to have support for this funding that's necessary and crucial for, for research, uh, the, the public needs to understand what's going on. So I think I think about this question in a little bit of a broader context. So I think it's important not just for, for society to have some basic understanding of science, but it's perhaps more important for society to think about the sciences. So what I mean by that is to really understand that decisions that are made, that you make about your own health, about anything in life, decisions that government makes, decisions that, um, about things that are put out in the media even, need to be based on scientific methods at this point. So understanding that um, to make decisions based on evidence, what that evidence is, what sources are reliable sources to count on versus things that are not reliable sources to count on. So um, it may be hard to get everybody in society to understand about atoms and molecules and you know things of that nature, but if we can, as a society, at least approach decisions um, based in more of a scientific method, or even to understand that decisions that are made are based on evidence and scientific method, then that actually can help us to kind of build some bridges in terms of understanding. Even if you don't understand the nitty gritty of the science, at least understand the process by which decisions are made. That's a very good point. Um, does the public have a responsibility to understand science and what it does in society. If they do, how do they obtain this information? What modalities should they use in this era of fake news? So newspaper, articles, what should we be looking at to get that evidence that you said? Um, 
reliable evidence because we know we see tabloids blowing up the news. Um, what do you think about that? Um, so one of the areas where I work is actually trust. Um, uh, trust in particular in the uh, scientific community and uh, this has been a concern <laughs> given as we were talking about fake news, fake news. Um, and the fact that uh, it is difficult sometimes to determine what is reliable information and who is giving that information. Uh, so yes, uh, there is a responsibility on the side of the public, of all of us, to have knowledge of the sciences. Um, uh, again, for all of the reasons that we just mentioned, given that otherwise it's difficult to make informed decisions. Uh, but it's also very hard to uh, determine what kind of information is actually reliable. Most people, uh, most citizens don't have a science background that allows them to go to nature, for example, or science and check the journals and see what exactly it is that scientists are saying. Most of us get that information from the newspapers or from Facebook, which is even worse. Um, which means, of course, that a significant amount of information that we get uh, is not reliable. Uh, but nonetheless, we are making decisions grounded on very bad information. So we are obviously all responsible uh, for that, and we need to be um, part of my work, again, is to get people to be more critical of uh, both the sources of information, where we um, uh, get uh, information about the sciences, and the way in which sciences, uh, uh, the research enterprise works. So you all have around the same answer for that question? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's just so much information out there, and you know, what do you trust, right? A lot of us use a lot of social media. There's so much that goes on it, a lot of it is hashtag fake news. <laughs> um, but I think, I think what Christina mentioned is, is really important, right? that we have to question things. That even if we're reading something, well, what was the study that was done? And, and that you don't have to have a lot of science knowledge uh, to, to come up with those questions, right? How many studies have, to, have been done to, to look at this question? Where were these things published? Um, what's the consensus sort of in society about, about this? I mean, the, the big example is vaccines, right? Um, and, and because of one paper that was unfortunately published years ago that, that it eventually had to be retracted, uh, this whole fiasco has been created around, around vaccines. Um, and so I think we just have to, we just have to question things and question the, the sources that, that we are reading from. I, it's kind of, I think, a difficult question, right? Because as scientists, we, we read research papers, right? We read, read from science or from nature or from cell, from any of these journals, but that's something that, that the public doesn't really have access to. I think, uh, I think that there's now different programming that's, that's becoming available to scientists to sort of train them as communicators, right? So one example is that the AAAS, or the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, has a fellowship specifically for scientists that has to do with mass media communication, right? How does a scientist speak in public? How does a scientist talk on a, on, on a news channel like CNN? Um, how do they relay information? And then those workshops are also provided on college campuses and at universities to sort of start training scientists to be able to speak about these things to the public uh, that doesn't necessarily have a strong scientific background. So um, I just want to say, don't underestimate your power as students who are in science who have some basic understanding to push forth good knowledge among your peers, among your family. Um, because I think a lot of what we see in terms of people believing pseudoscience or not believing pseudoscience and things like that, um, social pressure actually is a powerful thing. Um, I've seen in the last 10 years um, there being a, well, at one point being an ex there being acceptance for people who 
are anti-vaxxers or even question vaccines or um, um, even like the timing of when vaccines can be given to now a more of a social pressure for dismaying some of the, the information that is out there. And people now not accepting pseudoscience and say vaccine. So there is a change, and a lot of it comes from just general society who don't even have science backgrounds to kind of push the norms into different directions. So that is also a very, very powerful thing. And um, also, um, I want to bring up that even understanding of just some basic math can really help to understand whether science is good science or not good science. So understanding what a percentage means or what a volume or a concentration means. So you'll see a lot of headlines in the news or um, let's say the example of vaccine about mercury being in vaccines, right? So think about, well, what's the concentration of that? What concentration is actually harmful, right? So um, just because things are advertised as being poisonous or bad, or you hear these words toxic thrown around a lot, that something is toxic. Well, at what level is something toxic, right? So questioning things like that um, and bringing it to your, uh, the attention of your family and friends as students who are, have some kind of consciousness about science can also help to kind of um, uh, push the society peer pressure, let's say, towards accepting good science. Yeah, that's very important, especially you all as junior scientists. Um, definitely don't always be so quick to jump on the bandwagon. You know, um, you have those resources, you know how to read through scientific journals, you have amazing professors here who are more than willing to help you look into these problems. So don't always be so quick to jump on the bandwagon and say, yeah, vaccines cause autism, or they have mercury, or whatever we've heard. Um, so what is the role of dissent and multiple narratives considering new scientific policy? So these contrasting opinions that we often see with designer babies, the issue of climate change, which is such a hot, hot, hot topic right now, and 23andMe. So 23andMe, for those of you who don't know, is a kit where you can sequence um, your, your DNA and pretty much see what's going on. But the problem with that is you don't know who's getting access to this information. Dr. Medina Ramirez, we'll start with you. <laughs> so, in terms of access to information, um, so what is the role like, that we see with these contrasting opinions, yeah. um, considering new scientific policies and procedures? Well, we see. So, what is the role of ethics? when we see these, these issues arise. So I think it's important for those who are making decisions about where to draw the lines on these ethical issues actually do understand the science, even though perhaps society might not have that deep understanding. Those who are making policies definitely should have an understanding about what these things are. So for example, like the whole, we need to talk about GMOs and what that means and how that, you know, there's been a lot of fear with some of these terms that we throw around, like designer babies and uh, things like that. So um, an example of this is like the stem cell research that we have come a long way um, in terms of loosening the regulations on that. Um, I think at one point, there was not really enough understanding about what stem cell research was and what are, what scientists are actually, what the Asian scientists are using and where they derive from and things like that, that there was such hard restrictions on this research that it really put us behind some years with, with that sort of work. So um, I think it's important that those who are making decisions really have a deep understanding of the science that then can make the best decisions that fall both on an ethical line and also allow the science to move forward. Um, 
where that line is somewhere close. So Dr. Melo Martin, what do you think about this? So I, I work on this, so, um, so I have lots of things to say. <laughs> Uh, but I think dissent in science is in general good. In general, generally it's a good thing. Dissent in politics is generally a good thing. It's a way, I'm a million about that, those of you who have read John Stuart Mill, so um, it's a good way to get to better reasons, um, more correct um, understanding of a particular issue. But obviously sometimes dissent can be problematic as just were mentioning the issue of um, global warming. Um, so so on, on the one hand, we have these issues about what the sciences might say or not say. And then on the other uh, hand, we have issues about what do we do with that knowledge. So in the case of uh, reproductive technologies, for example, or genetic technologies, uh, how, what is the best way to uh, use those technologies, that knowledge, um, what kinds of societies do we want? And it is thinking about the kinds of societies that we want that allow us to determine what is that we want to do and what kind of research we want to advance. Normally, um, we go the other way around. We do have the technologies or the knowledge, and then now we have to decide what to do with it. Or often, we already use that knowledge or those technologies before we can think about how is this going to affect our society. So we, we tend to reflect too late <laughs> on uh, how to use um, our scientific knowledge and our technological knowledge. And sometimes we find ourselves in big trouble. So ideally, we can change that. You all can change that. I think, I think as scientists, we have a responsibility, right? And you, as a little big scientist, will also have and share these responsibilities um, to reach an ethical decision um, when conducting experiments. So recently in the news, you sort of mentioned this briefly about a designer baby. A couple of months ago, um, it was published that a scientist um, basically did gene editing in an embryo um, and then implanted that embryo in a woman and this woman gave birth to twins. Um, and so this genetic change that he, um, that he made in this embryo um, was supposedly to make the baby resistant to HIV. But these experiments, are, there have been no previous experiments leading up to this. Um, there was no oversight about this. He sort of just sneakily did this in an underground basement, seriously. And, um, yeah, it's crazy. And, and so this baby was born with this mutation of this one gene. We don't know what the consequences of that will be. And it turns out that it wasn't even the mutation that he was trying to induce in the gene that he was trying to mutate. It's a mutation in a different gene. And, the baby is not resistant to HIV, and uh, there, we don't know what's going to happen when this, when this baby grows and becomes an adult. Um, and so that's not ethically correct, right? Like, you know, you know how, do, how do you make a decision like that? So we, as scientists, also have to, have to be responsible when making these decisions and, and think about what the long-term consequences of this will be on society as well. So where does science draw the line when we're talking about ethics? Is there an actual something that they can go by? But why do we keep on seeing things like this happen? They, they keep on recurring. Um, I, I, so uh, as it was mentioned, scientists have responsibilities, obviously. It's not that, you know, they are not just scientists, they are also citizens, parents, daughters, you know. Um, so they have certain kinds of responsibilities as scientists to do things in appropriate ways. Now, what is appropriate might change, obviously. Um, and in some cases, again, we have this idea that if we can do it, we ought to do it. So this, this can be obviously dangerous. This was the case, for example, with the gene editing, 
we have the technology, it is possible to do it, good things could come of it, why not? Um, so that's the reason I was saying what we need is to be able to reflect on these advances before they are implemented so that both scientists and all of us have some idea of you know, how can we go about um, you know, pursuing this knowledge. Do any, would any of you like to add on? I think it's easy to fall into the temptation of wanting to push things forward, right? Like if I can do this, as I mentioned, then I'm going to try to do it, right? I'm going to try to push push science forward as, as much as possible. Um, but somewhere you do have to drop a line, right? And think of what those consequences are going to be. And those are long-term consequences when you think about things like gene editing, because now these are genes that don't be passed on to future generations, right? right? We're not talking about just that one person. so. The implications of this are beyond just that one instance. How can science change to promote both racial, ethnic, economic, and neural diversity in this and the next generation of sciences? How can science change to promote racial, ethnic, economic, and neural diversity in this and the next generation of scientists? In all the future generations. In all the <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that it's been shown, and we know, and it's been now published, that uh, diverse teams of scientists can push things forward a lot more quickly, right? And so I think part of what we both do uh, and we work on is doing exactly that, being able to give access to students to opportunities that perhaps they, they would not have had um, and expose them to science and uh, let them see that this is something that they can also do, uh, that they can also contribute to, uh, make them aware of those opportunities um, I think we have a responsibility as scientists to also, you know, as we said before, disseminate this information to everyone, not just some communities, um, and sort of level off the playing field for everyone, right? So that everybody can have access to these opportunities and these careers. So, um, as Raquel had said, um, it definitely has been shown that diverse group of thinkers students about science. And um, what I don't, one thing I would tell students who are given opportunities that are based in promoting diversity in science is to understand that um, the NIH and all these other uh, programs that may look for students from underrepresented groups to promote science, this is not a situation where you're looked at as a charity case that we just want different faces for our posters, right? That it really is a decision based on what is best for science. And some of the questions that come up in decisions, well, how does then thinking diversely and having diverse thinkers, how does that really work to promote science, right? How does you being in a room make things different in terms of how you're actually making decisions about science. And this is something that I think about often and really when you're when you're coming to the lab, it really should be promoted in, in laboratory research and in science that you are allowed to bring your whole self. Um, and whatever that may mean, right? So being able to how do you think differently? So some of the ways that I would say I thought differently as a scientist in the lab was coming from a background where I had to be very resourceful, right? So if you're not always given a lot and your problems are solved for you easily, you have to think about ways around that, right? How can you do things quicker? How can you do things cheaper, right? So um, these were ways that I thought about things in the lab that helped me to navigate some very hard questions, some very hard technical um, obstacles that I had. So when you're thinking about diversity in science, 
um, it really should be promoted that you're bringing all of who you are, your backgrounds, and not afraid to also share your thoughts and the way you think in that way. Right? We all think differently, and um, some of you know coming from a Catholic university, Catholic school, being able to have also faith in God and also science and being able to not only look at numbers and facts and how things work, but also to trust your gut when you're making decisions about which directions to take your work. Um, those things sometimes matter too. So having people who kind of approach problems in different ways and think different ways, it really is something that pushes forward science. And so don't ever think of these opportunities that you have uh, are, are opportunities just to again, have different faces in the lab, but really that you are bringing something important and special to your work and how you approach it and how you are helping others also to think about problems. Uh, so we live in a racist and sexist society, so our sciences actually reflect that society, uh, the prejudices that are common in that society. So, it is very tough, actually, to change that. Um, and one of the ways is inclusivity. If we are able to bring more people who have different experiences in a variety of ways, who look different in a variety of ways, then maybe we are able to uh, take down some of those um, biases, some of those prejudices. Um, it is. It is important, however, to, to recognize that diversity is important, not just because we can get better science, as we were just mentioning. Um, we have lots of evidence that shows that diverse uh, research teams um, are able to come up with more solutions, different kinds of solutions, to approach things in different ways. So we, we do have all the evidence that one might need um, for that. Uh, but but I, I, I think that even if that was not the case, even if it was the case that it doesn't matter how diverse scientific communities are, we are all, you know, we are still getting whatever, correct answers, still doing science is a very important thing for many people. It's fun, it's interesting, it allows us to learn things that we cannot learn otherwise, and people should have a right to do those things independently of whether or not the results that we are getting are better or not. The point is that we shouldn't be constrained on the choices that we want to make simply because we have the wrong sex or the wrong gender or the wrong uh, race or whatever it might be. So we should be allowed to do those things, not have uh, constraints that prevent us to do that. And a lot of the work that Raquel mm -hmm. and I do in diversity is just as what you're saying, to really just right. get rid of some of the barriers that just people who are bright and curious and able and also motivated to pursue science to do that if they wish. So, I mean, it, it, that's also very important. I mean, I mean, we're, we're examples of how those programs have worked, right? Like, we, we didn't have access to that information until somebody provided to us information about a program that would help introduce us to research. Had we not been introduced to that, had we not been given that information, we probably would not be sitting here right now, right? And so it's all about providing access to everybody and, and that being the right thing to do. Do any of the students have questions? Hi, I'm Christine. I am a, well, it's a little complicated. I am a sophomore in the pre nursing program. It's very complicated. Um, according to the Commonwealth Fund, our American healthcare system is ranked number 11 worldwide. This is based on equity, access, and cost. So it's a two-part question. The first part is, do you think our American healthcare system should change in the ways of ethics and how it does discriminate through income-based communities and race-based communities? And how can we contribute as the public society and as current or future medical professionals and researchers to change such a huge part of our lives? Wow, that's a dense question. Extra credit for you. Can we just summarize it a little bit? <laughs> 
No, oh, no, 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 Yes, the quick, uh, the quick answer is yes, it should change. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a healthcare system that certainly needs lots of changes. Uh, one of them, obviously, is uh, bias against a variety of um, uh, human beings, you know, based on ethnicity, based on sex. Um, we have, again, lots of evidence. Uh, racial disparities are rampant. Um, in many cases, they are just uh, um, bias that are implicit. People don't know that they have them, they don't try, physicians are not trying to discriminate against people. Uh, but that, this is part of, again, living in a particular context where those norms are prevalent. Um, so, you know, one of the solutions is try to train medical uh, students um, to be more aware of those biases and the ways in which those biases might actually uh, play a role without, again, intending for that to be the case. Uh, but individual solutions are not going to solve the problem. This obviously requires structural uh, changes that are not going to happen anytime soon, I suspect. And I think, I think it's sort of incorporated into, at least for MDs, that they have to go through uh, unconscious bias training, cultural competency training, uh, which were things that were not going on just probably even 10 years ago. Um, so, so it's something that I think it's being built into the curriculum now so that people can be more conscious of, of what communities they're working with. So I have a question. How about the, I mean, I had a lot of pre-nursing students and they are in the front line to our patients. Is there education for implicit bias for them? And when do they get that education? Is that even available? Um, do we know of it? For nursing students, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is also training. Uh, now, now, I have to say that though there is training, I think that the training that we have, either for nursing or for medical students, is insufficient. Um, and again, we have lots of evidence that show that, for example, medical students coming to school thinking the good of the community and being empathetic, and uh, this both for nurses and uh, medical students. And when they end. Uh, empathy has actually diminished significantly. So this is a problem of the medical curriculum, what is called the hidden curriculum, actually. Um, so though there is training, as it was mentioned, that we didn't have you know, a, a few years ago, still that training is not doing what we want it to do. I'm nervous, scared. I hope the words roll off my tongue the right way. <laughs> I find it to be really interesting that this combination of philosophy and science is in front of me. I'm currently doing my MPA public administration where I'm forced to look into policies and 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 I'm my master's thesis is on vaccines. <laughs> Should vaccinations be mandatory? And right away, we you guys mentioned it a few times. What I have learned from philosophy is to read between the lines, question the gray area, dig deeper. And science, I'm sorry, we have Avena Lotion, we have Dove, we have all these brands and options out there, even for lotion. There's no way, just without me even starting my master's, to think that this schedule is okay for all. That's my concern. Like, they, you know, we're forced to, Read between the lines, think about it, just looking at it, just black and white. I need a prescription if I itch too much. You know, if I, whatever, I'm just, you know. So there has to be, in my eyes, where one plus one equals two. There's no way vaccines could be okay for everyone. Everyone that comes over just, and then I guess once there is like a, um, an injury, then they are able to get a, a medical exemption. So that's what I was here just like, really? We, I just feel like that's, it was almost contradictory in the sense where we have to question it, but then we're saying it's okay. When there's not really, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> like, do you know, that's, like, that's my way of thinking. Like, I'm, I'm pushed to think and research and, and look into it. And just simply, even with my 14-year-old daughter, when I tell her, there's, it, there's no way this could be okay for everyone. We're all made differently. One size doesn't fit all. That's my thought. 
oh, I just need you to have a conversation. Right. conversation. Right. I've had at least that with medical providers mm -hmm. and patients about what the risks, benefits, and options are. I mean, at the very minimum, conversation should be there. Conversation with? With medical providers and patients about the, right, that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, often that is missed the yeah. conversation, mm -hmm. um, but it should, in my opinion, be at least a conversation about what these things mean. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's, we just continue to do what our mom, our grandparents did. We don't question. It's something that literally someone have a baby, they go to the doctor, and it's just it's what we do. Don't question the ingredients, don't question nothing's going on, and how that schedule has tripled since I've gotten vaccines or vaccinated. So, um, I mean, you bring up lots of interesting issues. Um, so, I think, it's, as, as we all, we're all saying, mm -hmm. questioning is fine. Um, it's the implications of the questioning that might be problematic. And questioning for the right reasons is perfectly okay. Again, that's what we want. Um, there, vaccines do two different things. One is they are population level solutions. And another is they might protect an individual, but there are also some risks, like anything that we do in our lives. There is nothing, certainly nothing in medicine that is risk free. Um, so when you say this doesn't work for everybody, well, that might well be the case. Uh, but the question is, we have a duty uh, an ethical duty, you know, to protect the community. And sometimes that involves certain kinds of risks that might be minor, but it's still important. And that, you know, we should certainly talk to um, uh, our clinicians about what those risks might be. But, but I think that often in this, in this uh, discussions about whether we should vaccinate or whether it should be mandatory, these two levels are mixed. What is good for me or my child and what is good for the community. And sometimes we hope that people are willing to do things that might be good for the community, even if that involves some risk to one, to one self. And I think that's why medicine is taking more of a shift to individual medicine per person. And you see more genetic testing because we have the same concerns for chemotherapy. Um, and antibiotics, so that was a great point to bring up. Um, so what should happen to scientists who ignore ethical directives when using scientific technologies, such as gene editing in their research? <laughs> so what do you think is your opinion? What should happen to these scientists when they, they do not follow those policies that are put in place so, uh, so this is one, one of the problems, is we don't have m much policies regarding what to do about gene editing, for example. Um, and the policies that we have tend to be guidelines um, uh, that are developed by um, scientific societies. Uh, but in the United States, uh, in particular, um, actually European countries have uh, stronger regulations regarding reprogenetic issues. Uh, but the United States actually have very few uh, regulations. Um, and so it's, it would be difficult to determine what to do with scientists who decide uh, to do certain kinds of things because it's not criminal. There are no criminal uh, impositions in these cases. Uh, so it would be a question about what scientists as a community decide to do and how that is going to affect the particular individual. But that's one of the problems that we have today. That there's no oversight. Right. And I think that's a huge issue, right? So when this gene editing baby situation happened, the National Institute of Health may put out a statement, uh, the American Society for Human Genetics put out a statement uh, condemning that and, and saying this is not right. Um, what can you, you can't arrest somebody, yeah. right? But perhaps um, one way that that could be tackled is by funding, right? Or, or not funding. Uh, I, I don't think that if the scientist ever requests funds from the NIH, I don't think that he's going to get any further funding, right? So perhaps that's, that, that's one way in which potentially these scientists can be sort of um, stopped. But yeah, actually, there is no 
public funding in the United States to do embryo research. Nobody can get any funding from um, federal funding. So all of the research that is being done with embryos, and we do very good research uh, with uh, embryos, is actually private funded. So, so that's another problem is, yes, we could have regulations that prevent funding, but if it's only public funding, then you know, someone is going to be willing to give money to do this research. But I think it's important for the scientific community to, to loudly denounce right. this type of behavior because it causes distrust between the public right. and scientists, and then that's not good for any type of science that is happening when you start building this distrust. So I think it's important for the scientific community to loudly denounce the I'm just curious to know what you think the response would be from the I, I still think that they would have condemned it. I, I still don't think that it would have been looked upon. Because, I mean, he didn't really have any conversations with anybody about it. Or I think he did with a couple of people, but, but it, it's not a scientifically accepted uh, way of doing things, right? And so I still don't think that it, there would have been a positive reaction. Uh, I, what was that? I, I couldn't hear the question, I'm sorry. I was just asking if you would have what, noted the gene correctly. what the response from the medical community would have been if that had been a successful So I think there are two, two issues. I mean, it was sex. If, if it did happen, there is still questions about whether, in fact, he did this. Uh, but if he did, the fact that the mutation was not the one that he intended seems irrelevant. The fact is that he did try to do the mutation. So that's what is the problem, whether it was not successful. Um, so that's one issue, and again, because we don't have oversight of these kinds of experiments, just uh, a, a, a denunciation on the side of the scientific community that we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, my suspicion is that, and, and you know, we have some evidence of this, is that if someone does this and is successful, the scientific community will be less likely to denounce it because there are lots of things that one can argue that would be good about gene editing of uh, embryos. You know, lots of arguments that, lots of people who argue um, uh, you can cure diseases and eliminate certain kinds of uh, diseases from being transmitted to future generations. And that's an argument that is compelling to many people. Uh, so my concern is that someone is going to be able to do it um, that is going to be successful, and that we are not going to be able to reflect on the consequences of that. I have a quick question. What do you think the role of non-scientists could be in this discussion? Like, how about people like just us? What can we do? What can we say? How can we be a voice to either prevent this or at least be more mindful of the fact that this is going on? I, I think about that. I just don't know what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I mean, part of the issue is obviously we, we, um, we have little discussion um, about science, the scientific agenda in, in, in the country. So there are, you know, citizens are very rarely involved in what kinds of research should or shouldn't they be done, or considerations about, you know, what kinds of things we could, we want to spend our money on. Um, so we are citizens and you know we have a variety of ways to get our voices heard. So uh, clearly, you know, as, as students and as faculty, uh, we have a significant amount of power, um, you know, because we have the knowledge and the resources available to do, you know, to complain, to uh, have groups that, you know, take this to, uh, to our representatives and to try to uh, you know, to write newspapers, so to do the kinds of things that would get our voices heard. It's not easy, uh, but it's certainly you know, something that we all have a responsibility to do. And I, just last week I was, um, there was, there's a new initiative by the National Academies of Science called New Voices. We know a couple of people who are actually on that committee, uh, and they're scientists who are involved in public policy who work in the government now to sort of uh, impact those decisions that are being made. And something that really struck me, I, I saw a slide of a poll that was done uh, about how many people know a scientist. Like, do you know a scientist, right? 
and only 20% of the people that they polled knew a scientist, just any scientist, not even somebody that you know personally. Um, and out of that 20%, 30% mentioned Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> right? <laughs> Or at least 20% of, the, of, of those polled, the other 80% could not name anybody. Right? And that's an issue. Another, another slide that really struck me was how many people know where biomedical research is conducted. And I think only 10% of those polled knew where biomedical research is done. Um, and the top place that came up was, I think, Johns Hopkins, followed by the Mayo Clinic, St. Jude, because they see that uh, on commercials on TV. But that was it, right? And so it just means that there's a big disconnect between the science that's being done and what information the public knows, even about where science is being done. So that's something that we have to work on. Yeah. How can science instrument in transforming public policy? I think, I think more and more scientists are now, as I just mentioned, becoming involved in, in, in policy making. I mentioned the AAAS a little earlier. Um, in addition to the mass media fellowship that they have, they also have a policy fellowship, a science and technology policy fellowship. And the scientists who do that fellowship actually spend one to two years working in a government office. And they're working with somebody who actually does make these decisions um, and, and sort of influencing how these decisions are made uh, based on their scientific knowledge, yeah. Great. Um, what are three challenges? I mean, what are three, three forms of advice you wish you could give to yourself about 10, 15 years ago or when you were in RC? And can I add to that? With, because I represent the Women's Leadership Network, I'm particularly interested in the women's angle of that. How do you see women fitting into the scientific community? Is it a rise? Is it, you know, are there great roles that we should play? Be more active? How to do that? Sure, I, I, think, I think over the last couple of years, there's been a shift, right? I, I, I work with graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania. And 60% of the incoming class last year was female. Ah. <laughs> St. Francis scientists. And, you see? So I, I definitely think that uh, things are, are changing. That's not the case everywhere. That's definitely not the case everywhere. Um, but I think that that's hopefully a trend that will continue. I don't know what, what you see. So as I have um, stats recently from our Science Learning Center, and 71% of Students who use the Science Learning Center are female. So um, that's a big number, but also what we're seeing is that of that 70%, um, it's more likely that the males who come will return multiple times. So there's still some work to do in terms of women in science and also to build your uh, self-efficacy to actually believe that you are capable and when I was here at St. Francis, what really triggered, the, well, even though I was interested in science and had done the summer internship, it wasn't until after the summer internship that I really believed or saw myself as a scientist because I had a research mentor who was African-American, women of color, scientist, and she was also a mother of two. So seeing a woman of color in that role um, really transform my thinking that, wow, I can also do that and be her in a way that male mentors couldn't try get to my, my head in that way. Um, so I think it's great that we have so many female professors here at St. Francis in biology <laughs> who are actually great influences on the women who are here, great role models. So um, I applaud that about this, the college for um, employing so many wonderful uh, biology professors who are women since our the bunch who are here. So I, I think that um, although we, again, as, as it was just mentioned, the majority of, we, of, of our graduates actually from the biomedical sciences are women, which is very good news. Unfortunately, 
uh, there is a very small minority of women actually in positions of authority um, in all kinds. So the higher you go, the fewer women you find, and the fewer minorities you find. So um, this is very puzzling because people always say, well, but you know, all of the women that are graduating, you know, this should be very good news. Well, it certainly is good news. Uh, but it's still the structural problems that women have to face when they go to the university, when they go to work, when they want to be promoted, when they want to get tenure, um, are still present and are still very difficult to, to address. Um, and, and the funny thing is that, you know, as you were asking, is what can women do? It's just the problem that then women have to, they are the ones who are being affected, but they are also the ones who have to fight for the solution. Uh, which puts us in, obviously, a double bind here. Yeah. In the diversity world, we went from this model of just looking at the pipeline and pushing people right. through the pipeline to now the leaky pipeline, right? Where are we losing people? And definitely, it's at the higher end that we are losing a lot of women and um, people of color in science. There's definitely, um, there's a lot of data on that, including not just uh, people of color get faculty positions, but when you look at who are getting the big grants, right, and there's a great disparity there as well. So it's not just putting people with faculty positions, but also supporting them through successful research and tenure. So wrapping up this conversation, what are um, advice that you would have given to your undergrad you? Something you wish you would have known <coughs> before when you were younger that you learned? I, I think one thing that, that I wish I would have known here um, was that it's not a linear path, as you mentioned, right? So I, I did my undergrad here at St. Francis, as I mentioned before, um, and you're sort of taught that you're going to go to undergrad and then after doing my summer research program, I thought that I was going to go to graduate school, so that would be the next logical step. Um, but life happens, right? And so I had a sister who, who was really sick while I was a student here, um, and I had to drop a semester, and then I had to take a year off after I graduated, and I sort of felt a little lost, right? Like, what am I going to do with my life? How do I get back on track? Um, and, and had I known that it that it's not a linear path, um, that everybody has a different path and you can still reach your goals, I probably would not have stressed out as much about it then <laughs> as I did. Um, I ultimately did get back on my path uh, to becoming a scientist, but um, that and not being scared. So I used to be really nervous, Christina knows. <laughs> um, and so holding, gra grabbing on to those opportunities that are presenting, presented to you, um, would have would have been advice that I would have given myself that yeah. I would also say um, to pay attention as you're going through your courses and whatever programs. Pay attention to your inner voice and moments where you feel happiness and joy, because that will steer you to the work that you love. Um, many times you come in, set on a path. But be a nursing student, and you just go through that path, and then you don't really pay attention to the things that are bringing you joy throughout the day. So, for me, when I was a graduate student, and I would leave the bench every so often for an hour or two, or two to work with summer students on campus on their research projects and mentor them, that was the moments of my day that really brought me joy and motivated me to get through and complete my degree. In move towards my, my goals of actually coming back and working with students. So listen, as you're going through the courses and, and the very busy life of an undergrad, pay attention to those things that make you happy. Take note. Come back to those, those thoughts. Yeah, I don't know what advice I would have given myself. <laughs> um, it's tough to think about that. So, so maybe I can give some advice now. <laughs> uh, so enjoy, enjoy what you do. Uh, think about all of the effect, the fantastic effect that you can have, whatever you do, you know, whether you're a scientist or a philosopher. 
Um, and, um, and remember that you are more than just a scientist or a philosopher, you are also a citizen and that you have responsibilities in all of those roles that you have. So, so enjoy while you do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like to... But I would, I really want us to think about how we can fix these, these leaky holes in the pipeline. Like she said, most of us here are women. You're hearing this from prominent women in their own field. So just know it's not impossible. And there are women in these fields. So that can be you, regardless of what you want to do, whether you want to be an MD, PhD, or go into business, finance, whatever. Just always think about that, those leaky holes in the pipeline that is in every field, not just science. Thank you.